Only the English Channel and a few hundred RAF pilots stood between Britain and invasion. Now Adolf Hitler stood just as Napoleon had stood more than a hundred years before. As Britain prepared to fight to the death, thousands of Polish servicemen came here, the last free country in Europe. We knew that England would continue fighting, you see, and, and uh, uh, we could sort of join them. They'd fled their homeland and crossed Europe. Now the Poles had only one desire, to fight the Germans. Our country was defeated. We wanted it back. The commitment was total. The Poles were eager to fight. Britain was short of pilots. There was just one problem. Next. None of them spoke the language. The only English words we knew were yes and no. The only problem was knowing which to use. Jan Zumbach had qualified as a pilot two years earlier and already seen action in France. Have you typhus? He described the obstacles he and his fellow airmen faced in his memoir. Have you migraine? We were continually at cross purposes with the British officials. Have you TB? A friend of mine had just about run out of patience when one doctor solemnly inquired. Have you had VD? Had VD? Had VD? What's that? So he took a chance, answered. Yes. And was promptly hauled off for a vigorous massage of the prostate. Examination, please. But they couldn't understand what we were saying. And I'm quite certain we couldn't understand what they were saying, because I myself didn't know a word of English. And that was a great barrier, both socially and, more important, operationally. But Britain was desperate. On July the 22nd, 303 Polish squadron was formed at London's RAF Northolt. To overcome the language barrier, its pilots were placed under English-speaking commanders. Captain John Kent, an experienced Canadian pilot, recalled his reaction at having to chaperone the Poles in his autobiography. It was just about the last straw to find myself posted to a foreign squadron that had not even been formed. I was thoroughly fed up and despondent. Kent wasn't alone in his view. Hello, boys! They didn't think we, we really have any stomach for, for fight anymore. That, that we are a spent force and that we are an embarrassment and a burden. Out of all the Poles, only two of them have any English at all. Kent's commanding officer was Ronald Kellett. It was his job to turn 303 into a fighting force. The men are being taught basic operational vocabulary. All I know about the Polish Air Force is that they lasted three days against the Luftwaffe. Well. Let's hope we can make them shine more brightly operating from England. Time was running out. Germany's high command wanted to complete the invasion of Britain before the winter set in. In early August, the Luftwaffe intensified its mission to destroy Britain's defenses. The Germans had two and a half thousand aircraft. The RAF, just over 600. Angels. Angels. Meanwhile, Zumbach and his fellow pilots were confined to the classroom. Pancake. Every morning, a bus would take us ten miles to Uxbridge Pancake. to learn the basic vocabulary which would be coming over the earphones. Pancake. Angels, Angels for thousands of feet altitude. Angels. Pancake for landing. Pancake. Bandits for enemy planes and so on. The angel. It's the height. <laughs> you see. There was in thousands, seriously. Bandits. Bandits. After three or four weeks of very intense classes, my vocabulary was good enough to say, read a paper. But I couldn't pronounce it. Captain John Kent came up with his very own strategy to vault the language barrier. Aeroplane. Air O. Plain. Samolot. Sam, Sam, Sam. I had to learn some Polish. Sam Olot. I went round the aircraft giving English names for the various parts and getting the Polish in return. 
Win. Skrzydło. Shit. Shit. Skrzydło. Gradually, I worked out a complete procedure in Polish and had it all written down phonetically on my knee pad. It worked very well and amused the Poles a lot. Shit. Ken. Yes. No. Kentowski. <laughs> <laughs> Kentowski. <laughs> Just one more chance. Despite Kantovsky's efforts, the Poles were increasingly frustrated. Each night I say a little prayer for. It was almost a year since they'd fled Poland. But instead of flying fighters, the British commander Kellett had them training on bicycles. Poles wanted to go to battle straight away, and Kellett didn't want to allow it until they were ready to cope with the radio communications and so forth. Zumbach was starting to doubt he would ever get back in the war. Child's play. If the British are wasting so much time with their childish exercises, when all of us have already won ours, how long is it going to take them to train up their young recruits from scratch? And would I eventually get an enemy in my sights before he won the war? <laughs> you man, stop that! We were all very, very eager to get on with, uh, uh, get on with flying, but we had to wait, so we were a bit frustrated. Listen, you're here to train for battle with the Germans and not to fool around and argue with each other. So when exactly will my men start training in hurricanes? Witold Urbanowicz was a legendary Polish flying instructor, desperate to get his pilots back in action. I brought my cadets from Poland through Romania, Syria and France. I don't want people crashing around the sky until they understand what they're being told to do. My men did not come all this way to sit around learning English. There's nothing more that we can show the Poles on trainers. Very well. Have the squadron proceed to operational training on hurricanes. The poles of 303 were finally back in the air. But before they could fight the Germans, they had to learn to fly in formation, the British way. Perhaps the training period was unnecessarily prolonged. And this certainly irked the pole, but we still had to be quite sure they knew how we operated. Back home, the poles had flown planes with fixed undercarriages. In a British fighter, they had to remember to lower the wheels before landing. Not all of them did. We had several aircraft landed with the undercarriage retracted. One of these was put down by Sergeant Franischek. Stand to attention, Francis. And I tore him off a first-class trip. Do you have any idea of the damage you've just caused? He didn't know what I was saying, but he knew he had to answer in a foreign tongue and kept repeating. We oui, commandant. Among some of the things I said to him was, "How in hell do you think you're going to fight the Germans if you can't even fly the ruddy aeroplanes?" We oui, mon commandant. Go on. What Kent didn't know was that Joseph Frantischek had already shot down 11 German aircraft in France. Dismissed. But Frantischek would soon show Kent exactly what he was capable of. By mid-August 1940, Britain had lost half its frontline pilots. The say was that if you... Uh, lasted the first week of an operational tour, you were probably quite safe. The British believed the German invasion was just weeks away. With recruits as young as 18 being killed quicker than they could be trained, the RAF was losing the battle for Britain. There were chaps who have flown, for example, 15 hours, and they were thrown into the battle. A lot of them didn't come back from their first flights. 
Despite this, the experienced Poles of 303 were still not cleared for action. On the 30th of August, the British commander, Ronald Kellett, led them on yet another training flight. But this would be a training flight with a difference. As Ludwig Paskiewicz wrote in the squadron diary, After climbing about 10,000 feet, we flew northward. After a while, I noticed ahead a number of aircraft carrying out various turns. Green 1! Green 1 to have a new leader! Man, this 12 o'clock! Paskiewicz was an experienced pilot, but had not yet engaged the enemy in combat. The training flight had strayed into a battle. A German raid was under attack over St. Albans. The sight of the enemy was too much for Paskiewicz. Without waiting for orders from his British squadron leader, he took matters into his own hands. I opened up throttle and bent in the direction of the enemy. I noticed that my own altitude bomber turning in my direction. When he noticed me, he dived sharply down. I turned over and dived after him. I noticed the black crosses on wings. Then I aimed at the fuselage and opened fire from about 200 yards, later transferring it to the port engine, which I set on fire. I drew very close, and I gave him another burst. Almost one year after the invasion of Poland, Ludwig Paskiewicz claimed 303's first victory against the Germans. He hit the ground without pulling out of dive and burst into flames. I have fired that enemy aircraft for the first time in, in my life. Training flights are precisely that. Training flights. That means you don't go gallivanting around the sky shooting up Germans. The safety of your squadron is your first consideration. However, I do feel it is my duty, despite my better judgment, to congratulate Pilot Officer Paskiewicz on making the squadron's first kill. Sir? Well done. Thank you, sir. Very good. Carry on. Although he had already been in action in Poland and France, it was Paskiewicz's first kill. He was hugely elated, and so were we. Under the circumstance, sir, I do think that we might call him operational. That night, Kellett put in a call to fight a command. Thank you, sir. The Poles were back in the war. 303's first operational day marked a bitter anniversary. It was exactly a year ago that the Germans had invaded Poland. Naturally, every pilot wanted to share the honor of the first battle. We had to draw lots for the different flights. I was lucky enough to draw the short straw. We're flying some We're flying. <laughs> Our aim was to, to be active and to fight. We were not fighting for England or France or then we were waiting for our country. The pilots knew full well what Nazi invasion meant. In Poland, the wholesale destruction of a people was underway. Schools and colleges had been shut, teachers and doctors shot, and the first prisoners had arrived at a slave labor camp called Auschwitz. Since leaving Poland, Miroslav Ferec had made it his duty to keep a record of events in what became the Squadron Diary. We are surprised that Adolf isn't taking advantage of this beautiful weather. You'd think he'd be bombing so hard you could hear echoes across the island. But it hasn't started. It was Ferec that, that kept the diary. 
and he would invite other pilots to make a contribution. Well, I was never invited to the Dadu, so I was too, too small of a little minnow, you see, in the, among the aces. <laughs> What's going on? Maybe it's a lack of personnel. <laughs> He's planning something. Organizing day-long wait, at 5.50, the Poles were finally scrambled for action. Fighter Command radar detected 200 German aircraft crossing the channel. Red leader, red leader! Man, the 303 was about to be tested in battle for the first time. Take the targets and go get them! Ferrich had fought the Germans in Poland in outdated aircraft. Now he experienced his first dogfight with the enemy in a modern British fighter. I caught up with him easily. He grew my sights until his fuselage filled the whole luminous circle. It was certainly time to fight. I did so quite calmly and was not even excited, rather puzzled and surprised to find that it was so easy. Quite different from Poland, where you had to scrape and strain until you were in a sweat. And then instead of getting the bastard, he got you. These Polish, uh, they loathe the Germans. All we were interested in was to destroy airplanes, whereas the Poles, they wanted to kill anybody that was in these airplanes. In less than 15 minutes of furious vengeance, each of the six pilots of Kellett's flight had shot down a Messerschmitt. Vitol Durbanovich recorded their spectacular first day in the squadron diary. Well, this is dated the 31st of August, 1940. And there's actually a, a, an illustration here of the action that went on. I'm looking to see if there's an indication of how well it went. The exact count I can't tell by the writing, but I get the sense that this, this, this was a, uh, a very successful engagement. Here they are! <laughs> get the whiskey down, Barry! Our squadron leader took us by Rolls Royce to the orchard and rice lip. They had found out on the grapevine that the Poles had brought down six Messerschmitts and they were celebrating. The orchard, well, is a nice big bar uh, with a very pretty barmaid. That was the important thing. They wanted to drag us into the middle of the dance floor, but we wouldn't let them. We don't want to make a song and dance about our achievements. But news of the Poles' success had spread far beyond the orchard. From the Chief of Air Staff, Sir Cyril Newell. Magnificent fighting, 303 Squadron. I'm delighted. The enemy has shown that Polish pilots definitely on top. Congratulations. 303 Squadron has opened its account with a vengeance. The Poles had joined the battle just in time. Hitler's planned invasion was thought to be only weeks away. Repeat again, please, Goddard. Captain John Kent, a skeptical Canadian chaperone, was with 303 over the south coast on the second day in action. Realize we are only six. I repeat, Kent's only flight of six planes faced 150 enemy aircraft. Kent described how the Poles dealt with such overwhelming odds in his autobiography. Sergeant Rogowski, who was doing search formation behind, pulled up and went head on into the middle of them, closely followed by Franchek. The German formation split up and a general melee ensued. Oh. 
Kent watched amazed as the Poles flew head-on at the enemy bombers. With a closing speed of over 600 miles an hour, the slightest error would be fatal. Streams of grey trace of smoke crisscrossed the sky in all directions. It was impossible to hold a steady aim. And snap shooting was the order of the day. In the frenzied dogfight, a Messerschmitt repeatedly latched onto Kent. But each time it closed in for the kill, it was chased off by a Polish pilot. Kent was certain of one thing. The Poles hadn't learned to fly like this in England. Back at Northolt, Sergeant. Kent did his best to express his gratitude. Thanks. For keeping that hun off my tail. The hun. Off my tail. Okay. Not one, Mr. Schmidt. Six. But not all of 303 had returned to base. In defiance of orders, Joseph Frantischek and another pilot were harrying Germans all the way back to France. Frantischek had a habit of departing from the squadron and hunting on its own, which was perhaps against the discipline, but at the same time, because of his individual expeditions, his victories mounted. Frantischek a Czech pilot who had joined the Poles when his own country surrendered, was well on his way to becoming one of Britain's highest scoring aces. From Air Vice Marshal Keith Park. The group commander appreciates the offensive spirit that carried two Polish pilots over the French coast in pursuit of the enemy today. This practice is not economical or so sound now that there is such good shooting within sight of London. Ooh. I'm killing Germans. Many excellent pilots have died due to lack of discipline. You want to become one of them? I fly alone. In a unique compromise, it was agreed. From now on, Frantischek could leave formation to hunt alone. In just six days fighting, 303 shot down 24 enemy aircraft without the loss of a single pilot. We were one fighting family. Together we dreamed of a brighter tomorrow, when after the war, we would return to our motherland. As the battle entered a bloody new phase, the Poles would be at the heart of the defense of Britain. In this historic battle, the mightiest air force, after the British, is the Polish air force. Every day we are winning against the Germans. In just one week, the Poles of 303 had overturned British prejudice and proved their fighting spit. On the afternoon of September the 7th, they shot down 16 enemy aircraft in less than 15 minutes. It was a record unbeaten by any other RAF squadron. Gentlemen, be vigilant and careful to preserve your lives. Poland will need you at the end of this war. That same day, the German war machine unleashed its fury on a new target, London. Millions of firebombs rained down on the great city of London. Hitler's planned invasion was imminent. In preparation, the Luftwaffe attempted to smash the spirit of the British people. 
As he flew over the capital, 303's Canadian Captain John Kent witnessed the aftermath of the first day of the Blitz. I could see the fires that the Luftwaffe had started on this, the first raid on London. I had not realized that I could feel so deeply. But at that moment, I would have butchered any German I could lay my hands on. I was beginning to understand the attitude of the Poles. They're very much like us. We found that, uh, apart from the language and uh, the national differences, that uh, th 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 we thought and they thought more or less on the same lines, which was uh, kill the Hun. But not everyone believed a handful of ill-disciplined Poles could be shooting down so many Germans. Chief skeptic was their own group captain, Stanley Vincent. Treat these claims with a lot of reserve. Sir? I want you to go through them with a fine tooth comb. Yes, sir. But Vincent didn't wait for the intelligence officer's report. When the Poles took off on the 11th of September, Vincent went on his very own spying mission. He followed the 303 going into action, and he kept his distance and wanted to see how, how they do. He wanted to find out for himself. He didn't have to wait long. Bandits, three o'clock. A veteran of the First World War, Vincent had never seen flying like this. The Poles had jumped in on the scattered individuals and suddenly the air was full of burning aircraft, parachutes and pieces of disintegrating wings. It was so rapid, it was staggering. The British trained pilots to fire from around 400 yards. The more experienced Poles were able to fly to within 100 yards before they opened fire. The effect was devastating. I think anybody who was keen, and they were, and some of us were keener than others, was the closer you got in, the better. A bomber aeroplane is quite a, a large um, target when you get that close. Every time Vincent tried to get a German in his sights, a Pole dived in front of him and shot down his target. Vincent was transformed from skeptic to believer. I told Wilkins that what they claimed they did indeed get. Any luck, sir? My God. They're doing it. Sir? Scramble. The success of 303 Polish Squadron was becoming a powerful weapon of British propaganda. Squadron leader Urbanovich is watching his boys getting into formation. It'll be known within an hour or so whether a German plane has been shot down or maybe two or three or even more Germans. Good luck. But news of the success of the exiled airmen was most powerful back home. I was only 14, but I wanted to join the Polish Air Force. Unfortunately, I was arrested in June 1943 and after interrogation by Gestapo, I was sent to Auschwitz concentration camp and spent the rest of my war <laughs> in the Auschwitz concentration camp. So my aviation dreams were shattered in that, <laughs> in, in that sense. 303's success in the defense of Britain had turned Polish pilots into what one paper called the glamour boys of England. There was a sort of aura of romance about Poles. A policeman was standing by the car. He wanted to know why the car was left in the street without its lights on. <laughs> At first, they didn't know what to make of us, but once we had a better grasp of English, the social life improved. Would you leave a car like this outside a cinema in Poland? <laughs> no. We said, in Poland, Poland we, we ride to the, the cinema, cinema on, on horses. horses. <laughs> They all had the finest reputation, bowing and the kissing of hands, which, I mean, was completely unknown to some English people. It seemed over the top, and it also seemed if they did that sort of thing, could they be trusted? My name is Jan Zombay. 
The girls were nice and friendly, and so were their mothers. Would you like to dance? And fathers, well, the fathers were absent, most of them. I'm not surprised that the English girl went up after the Polish boys. Mm, the Polish uh, uh, men, they like to show off. She put a record on and clung even tighter than she had on the dance floor. Five minutes later, we came up for air and she withdrew into the bathroom. Zumbak discovered it wasn't just the pilots of 303 keeping a diary of their exploits. Even my limited English vocabulary was equal to this kind of subject matter, especially with the clues provided by the names of several members of my squadron. She had awarded them high marks in contrast to her rather disparaging assessment of her own countrymen. By my rapid reckoning, her survey was based on a sample of approximately 30. <laughs> Zumbak did not reveal the marks awarded to number 31. The British believed Hitler's planned invasion was just days away. On the 15th September, the Luftwaffe launched what it intended to be a final knockout blow to destroy London and Britain's morale. This day would decide the fate of Britain and stretch every pilot to breaking point. A 400 strong enemy armada crossed the channel. At 11.15, the poles were scrambled and thrown into battle. I had shot down a donier, then had to hide in the clouds with a bunch of Messerschmitts in hot pursuit. Even for experienced pilots like Zumbach, the stress of two weeks' combat had taken its toll. For the first time in my life, I was really afraid. The fear makes everybody cautious. Uh, so a degree of fear is a good thing. The, the important thing is to overcome the fear. And naturally, longer you fly, that process of initial fear, of overcoming the fear, wears you out. Everybody was afraid at one time or another. You don't know what the hell is going to happen, where are you going, and, and how the other side will react. Seconds seem to pass, wait minutes. You live in a kaleidoscope of rage and icy detachment, continually alternating fits of attack and escape, now freezing now sweating. Then, suddenly you emerge with a shock of surprise into a peaceful sky, as if you died and been reborn into another world. You block out if you are in a turn. It's dangerous, because it's the time when you're blocking out you can see, you don't know who is behind you. myself together and managed to knock out one of the chasing Messerschmitts before running for cover. I had to fade into a fat cloud bank, keeping an eye on my surroundings and gaps in the clouds. In the first epic battle of the day, 303 helped stop the German bombers reaching the targets and claimed 10 kills. But the squadron joker, Zumbach, was to run out of luck. Messerschmitt special used to come in, dive, and out. You know, in the air, when you're there, it's all in seconds. Oh, I've been hit several times, but I've been down twice, only twice. And each time, I got away, <laughs> you see. It's 
bound to be friends, I told myself. You're as good as in prison. I carefully fold my parachute, feeling pleased with myself for having kept hold of the ripcord. The sign of a cool head. Some men appear, and fire each time I make the slightest move. They all come to a halt. Except for one man who approaches with a peculiar weaving walk. He's pissed, I think. So, I took out my pistol, held it at arm's length, and threw it away. <laughs> then I see his uniform. It's British. At the top of my voice, I yell out, Allied fighter! Polish pilot! Sorry I fired! I, I didn't aim at you! Then why did you fire? I threw my gun away! To stop you moving! You're standing in the middle of a minefield! Zumbak was out of the fight, but the biggest day of the Battle of Britain was only halfway through. On the afternoon of the 15th of September, a second wave of German bombers pressed home their attack. As the battle neared its climax, every available aircraft was scrambled to fight for the survival of Britain. Up to 10 o'clock, 175 German aircraft have been destroyed in today's raids over this country. The Poles had only nine aircraft left. At 2.25, they were scrambled to help repel a 300-strong enemy force. Between 350 and 400 enemy aircraft were launched in two attacks against London and South East England. About half of them were shot down. Only seven aircraft made it back to Northolt. Five were so badly shot up, Kellett said they were fit only for scrap. Today was the most costly for the German Air Force for nearly a month. Against immeasurable odds, the RAF held its own. The losses were so high that Luftwaffe High Command realized that they won't be able to achieve air supremacy. His plan to break Britain from the air had failed. Two days later, Hitler postponed the invasion. That same day, Joseph Frantischek, who hunted alone, became the first 303 pilot to receive a British medal for bravery. This pilot has taken part in practically every operational flight carried out by this squadron. He has shown great gallantry in always attacking vastly superior numbers of enemy aircraft. With 17 confirmed kills, Frantischek became the highest scoring Allied ace in the Battle of Britain. He was killed less than a month later. 303 Squadron had shot down twice as many Germans as the leading British unit, for a third of the losses. On the 26th of September, King George VI made the first of many visits to congratulate the Poles. He was so proud, he said, we knew that means something, Poland, you see. The keeper of the squadron diary, Miroslav Ferich, made sure that the king ended up in the book. Whiskey, gin, sherry, oh. cherry brandy. Precisely why I'm not drinking. The missile me! Yeah, I don't care what it's called. Operational for under one month, on the 27th of September, 303 notched up their 100th kill. But the squadron's pride in its extraordinary success was overshadowed by a tragic loss. Ludwig Paskiewicz, the pilot who broke formation to make 303's first kill, had been shot down. He was only the fifth pilot of 303 to die. Jan Zumbach commemorated him in the squadron diary. He was one of our best friends. 
a brilliant pilot in love with his role. He gave his life to flying, and flying took his life. He did not die of natural causes or in an accident. He died in battle, having achieved what he'd always dreamed of, victory. He will be welcomed to the squadron of heaven. To Pasha. Zumbak was shot down in 1945, but survived. He later became a smuggler, mercenary, and ran a nightclub in Paris. The war had more than four years to run. But by October 1940, the Battle of Britain was over. Most historians agree that the Battle of Britain was won by a narrow margin. And it could be argued that perhaps this narrow margin was uh, supplied by the 303 Squadron. It is with genuine regret and sorrow that I terminate my association with the finest squadron the RAF has ever seen. Captain John Kentowski left 303 to lead his own squadron. My profound thanks for keeping me alive and teaching me how to fight. I'll never mind the flannel. In the book. Miroslav Ferich was killed on patrol in 1942. His precious diary was continued in his memory. By the end of the war, the 303 Squadron diary filled seven volumes. None of the 303 aces who fought in the Battle of Britain are alive today. Every year, a dwindling band of veterans gather at the Polish Memorial at Northolt to honor the fallen and keep their stories alive. This is my highest decoration, Virtuti Militari. It's one of the highest Polish decoration for bravery, and here, Defense medal, defense of the country is Britain, uh, you see. 1,973 Polish airmen lost their lives in the Second World War. But in spite of their sacrifice, Poland would be denied its freedom when the war ended. In February 1945, with victory in sight, the Allied leaders met at Yalta. Britain which had gone to war to defend Poland, now faced the growing power of the Soviet Union. Yalta was complete reversal of the British stand, and it was terrible shock for the Polish forces, which fought so valiantly. To pacify Stalin, at the end of the war, the Allies handed control of Poland to the communists. The dream of freedom the Poles had fought and died for was over. The Western Allies won their war. Everybody won except us. We lost. In June 1946, Britain held a spectacular Allied victory parade. Czechs, Chinese and Iranians all marched down the Mall past King George VI but not a single pole. My father was on the sidelines as, as the parade was going down the mall, not only giving no credit for it, but, but basically being uh, denied existence. It broke his heart. Plain and simple, it broke his heart. Not one of the 200,000 poles who fought fascism marched with the Allies that day. Britain did not invite them for fear of offending Stalin. We felt that the Allies really betrayed us. We were absolutely shattered. We were in despair, really, what to do. What about you, Ivanovitz? Will you go back to Poland? The papers are saying you should go home. Rebuild your country. 
There's no work for you here now. No. You know what brought us to France. And to here. You have won the war. But we have lost it. Vitold Urbanovich did later return to Poland. Accused of spying, he had to flee to America. Other pilots were not so lucky. A lot of my friends did go back. And some of them, or a lot of them actually, uh, made a sticky end. Unless you were a communist, you said, there was no future for you. At the end of the war, we were really not wanted in this country anymore. There is so many of us, and uh, we are competing for the jobs. People didn't really mind where we go, didn't, didn't particularly uh, press, press us to go here, or they just get out of the country, leave, go back to Poland, or go anywhere you like. I think we never been really welcome by English, really welcome. That's for sure. Rather, some may be polite and so, because we know on the English politeness, but, but not as a real welcome to this country, Polish people. I don't know why not. 